It is indeed a great privilege and an honor to be invited to stand in the pulpit tonight of this glorious church and try to speak a few simple truths to you based on the gospel of our divine Lord and Savior. I'd just like to preface my remarks by saying how much Mrs. Peel and I are enjoying our visit to Sydney. I am ashamed to admit to you that uh, having traveled for many years, this is the first time we have ever been in Australia. And the only way I can explain it is that we've been saving the best to the last. <laughs> Although I hope it won't be the last. We find that the Australians are such delightful people. In fact, I have to pinch myself now and then to, to remind myself that I'm not in my own country. And we truly feel to be among wonderful friends. I would like to speak to you for a little while on the subject, how to be vital, healthy, and alive. And I believe that is exactly what God intends us to be. When God created us, he breathed into us the breath of life. And he assumed that this vitality would be in us until the end of our day. Or is it not said that in him we live and move and have our being? And the reason that we're not vital or truly alive is because we let the life force be interfered with. We erode it. We destroy it. Now, there was read in your hearing tonight that wonderful passage of scripture from Isaiah. And I tell you, if anybody will live that passage out, he will be healthy, vital, and alive. How glorious it is. They that wait upon the Lord shall rise up with wings as eagles. Did you ever see an eagle rise up? I rose up the other day on a 747. But it wasn't in it with the way an eagle rises up. I saw one of them take off from a rocky crag in the Yosemite. He reached for the sky of which he was the master. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings as eagles. But that isn't the end of it. They shall run and not grow weary. They won't get tired. And that isn't the end of it. They shall walk. When the going is really hard and not faint, Almighty God built energy into you and me when we were babies. He implanted in us the life force. And true faith can keep this life force alive. A friend of mine went into a Park Avenue physician one day, a very famous doctor in New York, to get a report on tests. And the doctor said to him, 
All of my scientific findings point to serious trouble ahead for you. In fact, I would have to tell you that your life expectancy is very limited. Well, he said, how, how long? And the doctor said, I, I won't give you a specific time, but suffice it to say, it's limited. And the man said to him, is there no hope for me? Now, this was a wonderful doctor. Yes, he said, there is hope for you if you will have hope. I said, remember, my friend, I am only a person who works with God. We treat the patient. God heals him. If you will somehow find your way back to a deep relationship with God, you might prove my diagnosis to be in error. Now, on his own, without any guidance, this man walked up Park Avenue on a spring day. And it's an avenue in which we have trees and flowers. It was early April. And the flowers were beginning to push through. And the leaves were beginning to come out on the trees. The thought occurred to him, isn't it strange that these trees and these perennial flowers seem to know when it's spring and that they will emerge to new life? He saw the ineffable miracle of nature, and he reasoned that the operations in the natural world were also applicable to him. So standing there in this great avenue, he did a curious thing. A very curious thing. And I have done the same thing myself since he told me about this. He said, drawing himself up, I now affirm the emergence of the life force. And what is happening in nature is now happening in my physical body. He maintained this affirmation for days. On subsequent trips to the doctor's office, the doctor nodded his head with a smile. And finally, after many months, said the conditions that I stated to you some months ago no longer exist. You are a healthy, vital man. And when the man told the doctor what he'd done, this very great physician, with a joyous look on his face, said, you have thought and prayed and affirmed your way back into health. Now, of course, there are many things that a person needs to do if he wants to be healthy, vital, and alive. And I would say that the number one thing is to wash out of the mind all the old, tired, dead, listless, unhappy, unworthy thoughts. Dr. Sarah Jordan of the Leahy Clinic in Boston says, every day you should give your mind a shampoo. And if this is done, she said, there'll be fewer people in our clinic. The basic cause of illness is a lesion in the soul, which is caused by sickness in the mind. Hate, resentment, 
dishonesty, inferiority, and all the others draw and siphon off healthiness. I was riding in a taxi cab in New York one day with three other men. It was a beautiful day. And I had a joyous feeling about it. When I got into the taxi cab, I said to the driver, isn't it a terrific day? He says, so what? <laughs> he said, I know it's all right now, but it'll rain before night, maybe snow. And various other negativisms. As we rode along, these other men were calling me doctor all the while. And finally, the man that leaned around to me, thinking he had a, a medico in the cab, and he, he, that he'd get a little free treatment. And he says, say, doc, you know, I have pains in my back all the time. Well, I said, you shouldn't have pains in your back. How old are you? He said, I'm 37 years old. He said, I just ache all over. Furthermore, he said, I can't eat very well because I have pains in my stomach. And I, I don't feel good. What do you think may be wrong with me? Well, I said, look, my friend, it's against the law in the state of New York to practice medicine in taxi cabs. <laughs> but I said, you seem to be a nice fellow, and uh, I think I can diagnose your problem. I said, you know, I think what you really have is psychosclerosis. Well, this uh, shocked him so that he nearly ran up on the sidewalk. <laughs> psychosclerosis, he said, what in the world is that? Well, I wasn't too sure myself, but I, <laughs> I said, uh, you know uh, about arteriosclerosis, do you? No, he said, I don't know what that is. I said, well, that means hardening of the arteries, and that's a bad thing to get. But psychosclerosis is infinitely worse. That means hardening of the thoughts. Ever since I've been in this taxi cab, you've been exhibiting the symptoms of psychosclerosis. And I said, if you don't get over the psychosclerosis, the next thing you know, you'll have the arteriosclerosis. <laughs> well, he said, what in the world am I going to do? Well, I said, I tell you, you, uh, you come down to my office and uh, we'll give you a treatment down there. And he didn't know me at all. I handed him my card, and he said, Well, you're not a doctor of medicine. You're a doctor, you're a, a, a religious doctor. <laughs> well, I said, uh, That's the kind of doctor you need. You don't need a medical doctor, as far as I can see. You need a doctor of the mind and a doctor of the soul. Well, he made an appearance down at the church, and we gave him the treatment. <laughs> and after a while, he was cured of his psychosclerosis. And it didn't cost him anything either, <laughs> except the giving of himself, which he did. He had a, a redemption take place within him at the foot of the cross whereby he became not only a good Christian but a healthy, vital man. Now, you all look here tonight uh, uh, like the healthiest people in the world, but you know it's the mark of a sophisticated man not to reveal on that outward facade known as his countenance, the inner frustrations of his life. There are people here who are making themselves ill and are encouraging other maladies and diseases by unhealthy thinking. So the solution is to affirm the life force. Think the thoughts of God after him. Cast out all hate. 
Take in love. The most curative thought in the world is the thought of love. Just go around loving people. Cast out all negative thoughts and fill the mind with positive thoughts. Cast out all inferiority thoughts and fill the mind with victorious thoughts. Healthy mindedness. This it is that makes people healthy, vital, and alive. One summer Sunday I was preaching in a Presbyterian Church in East Orange, New Jersey, years ago. And after the service, a woman came up to me and she said, uh, I came to church today and I listened to your sermon and uh, I want to tell you that I itch all over. I said, Madam, I've had many results from my sermons, but that's the most astounding one I ever had. <laughs> She said, you know, it's a strange thing. I itch constantly. But I itch worse when I'm in church. And I often feel like I shouldn't come to church because I itch so bad. I said, maybe it's the cushions in the pews. No, she said, I've taken it up and it's not that. I, I just itch all the time. And she says, it's a, it's a, it shows as a kind of a, an eczema on my skin. She bared her arm away up and she said, take a look at that. And I got up and looked at her arm as far up as the law would allow. And uh, I said, there's not a thing there. Now she said, sir, don't you tell me there isn't anything there. Can't you see it? And I said, no, I have good eyes and no, no eczema that I can see. Well, she says... I itch all the time. Well, I got interested in her. She looked to me like an interesting case, and then besides, I liked her. I, and then I asked her to give me the name of her doctor. And that turned out to be more interesting. He said that this woman had a, had a low-grade temperature, ran about 100 all the time. I said, what's wrong with her? She says she itches. <laughs> yes, he says she's got eczema. Well, I said, I didn't see any evidence on her arm. Oh, he said it isn't on her arm. It's on her inside. It's in the mind. She has eczema of the thoughts. Well, I said, I never heard of that disease before. He said you won't find it in the uh, pharmacopoeia. But it's, uh, that's what's wrong with her. Eczema of the thoughts. And I asked him how he, how he came upon it. She said, this woman has a virulent, violent, evil hatred of her sister. She feels that her sister defrauded her when they probated their father's will. She hasn't spoken to her sister for 20 years. She is absolutely foul on the inside with her hate. And I asked him, what about the temperature? What caused that? He says, it's because of the instability of the entire system the body is trying to throw off this hate. And he said, uh, as long as she's appealed to you, if I were you, he said, I would give her the catharsis from sin treatment. This man used the most astonishing phrases. So I called the lady in and I said, your doctor says you're a downright sinner. <laughs> she said, I'll get another doctor. <laughs> yes, I said, you surely will. You've got one now. And I explained to her the mechanism. She finally saw it. And one day I compelled her almost by force to get down on her knees. 
and to give up this sin and to pray lovingly about her sister. She died hard. It was very difficult. You can't let go an unhealthy thought easily because it wants to master it. But finally, she turned and face toward the cross and the blessed Lord Jesus and she said Jesus my Lord forgive me a sinner and save me by your grace and cleanse me and I said that isn't enough tell the Lord you love your sister that was the hardest thing I saw the day when the two ladies walked down the aisle of my church arm in arm. And people, when they come into my church, don't usually smile up at me in the pulpit, but they did. They now loved one another. The doctor tells me she's now completely well, you see, you can't allow yourself the luxury of nursing these evil things because they will ultimately destroy you. Isn't it an interesting thing that the New Testament is so full of references about healing? Jesus Christ went around healing people and you remember he also went around exorcising devils from them now these weren't little men with tails and horns and forks those devils were were evil thoughts that were making them sick Jesus Christ is truly the great physician. He knows more about the intricacies of the human mind than any other who ever lived. He can heal you and keep you healed. He can heal me keep me here try living one day without any unhealthy thought you'll have the time of your life it may be very difficult and the next day you won't want to try it over again because it will have made you tired but try it another day until it becomes habitual and life will be good and you'll be healthy, happy, and alive. They that wait upon the Lord shall rise up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. And one final thing. I think one reason that we do not enjoy health and vitality and wholeness oftentimes is because we've gotten so locked in on ourselves. We are the victims of self-imposed limitations. We have naturally, by God's creative process, great and wonderful minds and souls. But we allow them to be uh, little I was in California the other day speaking in a place and the man who introduced me talked about expanded consciousness. And I got very interested in that and I began studying about expanded consciousness. His thesis is that you can actually take your mind and open it up and expand your consciousness. And live expansively. And that when this is done, you... You, you rise above all your problems and difficulties and look down upon them rather than up at them. 
then you begin to feel that uh, you're a master, that you, uh, you could defeat the world, uh, anything in life. That's the way a human being should be. That's the way God meant you to be. He said, you and I are children of God. We are the sons of God. And that doesn't mean that we're to live in a, in a narrow, conflicted, limited way. Expanded country. You've got to get altitude in the mind and in the heart. I close with this. I, my wife and I, a few months ago, were in Zermatt, Switzerland, where we've gone many times. I've always been fascinated by the Matterhorn. We were staying in the chalet of a friend of ours by the name of Ted Seiler, who's the old hotel family of Zermatt. And uh, looking out at the Matterhorn, was floating clouds over it. And I said to him, Ted, have you ever climbed the Matterhorn? He said, yes, I've climbed it three times. And each time has been a spiritual experience. He said, I may climb it again before I die. Well, said I, I'd like to get up on the top of the Matterhorn too. He said, if you want to get up on the top of the Matterhorn, I'll send you up there. I said, you mean you want me to climb it? And I am ashamed to say I expressed a negative thought. That, I, that it would be difficult for me to do it. Oh, no, he said, you're too old to climb it. That I resented. <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you to the top of the Matterhorn in a helicopter. And you'll never forget it if we get the right day. So this day dawned. Blue skies, crisp air, winds just right. My wife and I and a friend got into this helicopter, which is used for alpine rescue work. Very small thing. And we took off. We went down the valley of the Mott River, we made a turn and came back up over the Filmdown Glacier. Then we went higher and higher and took a turn and came down over the Gornigat Glacier, where there were crevasses a thousand feet deep or more, nobody knows how deep. Then he began to get altitude. Now, I've been in Vietnam, and I've flown in many helicopters, but was never at any time over 5,000 feet. But this helicopter went to 14,200 feet without any pressurization. Then we swept over the glacier to the edge of the world, nothing but blue before us, and hung suspended over an enormous valley surrounded by great rocky peaks and precipices. We went over the top of the Brighthorn, over Castor and Pollux. Then we headed for the Matterhorn itself, standing out there aloof and alone. They say the Matterhorn is not merely beautiful, it is a present. We approached it from the Italian side, the most difficult side. We began to circle it. We drove very close to the Rocky Mountain itself until we could see the faces of climbers going from the shoulder to the last desperate, difficult ascent. Higher and higher until finally we swept over the top of the enormous Matterhorn itself and saw there the cross where Climbers pray to give thanks. And then a moment later, we were on the landing pad in Zermatt. Out of that plane, I looked at my wife's face. She's a beautiful lady, but I've never seen her face like that before. Never. And my friend, his face was a light. We had only known the pilot for an hour. We embraced him as an old comrade. We were walking on air. It was an entirely different days after that. We 
felt masters of life itself. And even as I speak about it, it comes down on me again, an expansion of consciousness that rises above these things in life, which destroy us, defeat us, make us sick. Hence the text. They that wait upon the Lord shall rise up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary, never tired. They shall walk and never faint. They shall be healthy, happy, vital, and alive. Our dear Heavenly Father, we bless these people in thy holy name. And may each of us tonight be touched by the laying on of your hands that our consciousness may expand into health, wholeness, and vitality. And for this, we give thee the praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.